What's up? I'm Coach Dan Blewett, and today is video number five of our series here with Frank Alexander, who is the ATC and physician extender for the New York Yankees team doctor, Dr. Chris Ahmad. So Frank rehabs tons of players from Tommy John surgery, the UCL uh, brace repair, and just any sort of pitching related injury. I mean, their office sees a ton of them. So today's video five, and in this video, we're going to cover months eight through 12, which is, you know, sort of like that last phase before you get cleared. Now, most players are going to get cleared somewhere around that 12 to 14, 15 month mark. But usually like the year mark is like that big milestone. So we're going to talk today in this video about that whole mound phase, returning to actual game action and all the complications that come from it. It's a really complicated part of that journey coming back from a UCL uh, injury and Tommy John surgery. We're going to cover it in depth today in this video. All right. So I'm back here with Frank Alexander. This is video five in our series about Tommy John rehab. Um, and this is months eight through 12. And this is for sure the most complicated time. Well, it's just complicated in general after months eight, when you start to get back on the mound, uh, when you start to get towards games, uh, it just everything starts to like punch itself in the face. Like your strength training is making your arm angry. Your arms making your strength training harder. Your rehab is complicated, fitting it all in. There's just like lots of moving pieces in this phase. So, Frank, what are the first things? Um, first, what are what's going on when you get to months eight through twelve? So, this is we're starting the transition out of flat ground throwing and into mound throwing. So, at the end of a flat ground throwing progression is usually where I like to have guys. And throughout your flat ground throwing progression, we purposely in inlay download weeks. What a download week is: you are progressively increasing the stress that you're placing on your elbow. And now we're going to kind of decrease it just a little bit before we have another increase in your stimulus. So usually at the end of your flat ground throwing program, we have a download week and it depends on seasonal timing too, because right now, if you're in the middle of the summer and your ultimate goal is to get ready for the next spring, I may add another week or two of that download so that you're not going from high stress throwing at 120, 150 feet on the flat ground, then getting on the mound within a week or so of that. So I, I like to play around with some of that. And uh, with that kind of information, and where players are at in their throwing program, that's what will help me decide when they're going to get on the mound. So usually once you're on the mound and our throwing progressions that we have are kind of uh, let the players ad lib a little bit because your first couple weeks on the mound, you're just throwing fastballs and changeups, everything that goes straight. We're not putting any undue stress on your elbow. We're not throwing sliders or curveballs, anything that's going to spin. So everything is just easy, simple arm ball release and really focusing on mechanics. The one thing, like I said about ad-libbing, some players like to throw a flat ground or a short box, and then other guys like to throw a short box from the mound itself. So every player has a little bit of a different feel when they want to get back on the mound and what they're off their typical off season throwing program is going to look like. So I really kind of let the player, that's where I let them really have input into their program and really let them start taking ownership of it. Yeah. And, and this is complicated. Some, something that I was uh, writing about years ago when I, I did my second surgery was just how you start to use, like you talk about perceived exertion in different players. So 50% effort, 75% effort, 90% effort, you know, those are players overshoot that what is a 50% effort throw is typically like 77% of their actual velocity and like 75% through research has been shown to be like 90% of their velocity, right? And 90% is like 95%. So these, these perceived exertions, are, it's not 50% effort is 50% of your velocity, right? So it's significantly higher than that. One of the things I found that was an issue for younger players. So if you're, if you throw 80 as a high school player and you're asked to throw 50% effort off the mound in a rehab program, a lot of your off-speed stuff isn't going to make it there very well because you're using such a lower percentage of your velocity. Now you've got to arc a higher trajectory. This is especially difficult with like change-ups with youth pitchers. If they have any kind of, not like a surgery, but they have an arm injury and now they've got this protocol where they're going back to the mound and they're only supposed to throw 50% effort and they only throw 64 miles per hour. Well, it's like if you're going to throw 50 miles per hour change-ups from a 60-foot mound, that thing is going to be bouncing 
to have the typical release point trajectory, or you're gonna have to start to sort of aim for the catcher's face, and then they're they're like coming down with gravity. So there's definitely some complexities with throwing at reduced distances from full speed or from the from the full mound at the youth level and in, into early high school when kids don't throw that hard. Um, and so that's where I think the short box, which a short box for people that don't know, that's just essentially the catcher being closer to the, to the mound than normal. So like a short box would be like 55 feet throwing off the mound or from a flat ground is just throwing to someone who's squatting down from flat ground. So typically pitchers, especially relievers, will throw a flat ground after every game of catch. So, you know, you'll just have your buddy get down, give you a target on each knee from 55 feet or 50 feet. And it just helps you work on being downhill uh, from flat. So I found I find it ex- especially important to use the reduced distance from the mound, especially for players that have less velocity. So if you're like in the 80 mile per hour or less boat, your, fir- your first mound workouts should probably be 50 feet not 60 or 55 feet, not 60, because otherwise you're probably going to overthrow your velocity allotment to try to make it feel normal because it's very weird to go on the mound and like literally kind of lob it. Like once you're on the mound, it should be semi firm, right, Frank? Yeah. You should really have your, and I'm going to back up just a little bit here. And when we're talking about getting on the mound, You really have to have your mechanics under you too, because it's one Mm -hmm. thing to just get on the mound and throw again. You really have to be really working on your craft and your first time on the mound. You want to make sure you have that good arm action, making sure, like we said earlier in previous videos, the, your first time throwing at either, whether it's on the flat ground or on the mound, it's not going to go perfect. You're going to be like, I can't hit water if I fell out of a boat, but you know, being able to have those mechanics underneath you, one, is going to give you a a vote of confidence right there. And then being able to build on that and then making sure, like Dan said, to have a firm grip on things, not just the ball, but on just how you're feeling and your mound presence and making sure that once you're able to let that first fastball rip and let it go, then you, you really should be having some level of confidence behind you because you don't want to be hesitant when when you're starting to get back on the mound again yeah and so the mound phase will start with what 50 50 percent effort right and that's hard for players to gauge but again everyone who's designed those throwing protocols knows that 50 percent effort is really like 75 percent velocity so that's normal um but how do you keep players from go- overgoing their velocity right throwing too hard um you really just need someone there with them to be like hey hey like Let's back off a little bit. So if not the radar gun, which the radar gun is going to be tough because players will feel like they're throwing really hard and we'll cover this in in a couple minutes, but you're, you're essentially don't have your full velocity at that point, right? So I threw in the low nineties when I I did my, uh, my last surgery. And so, you know, if I was throwing 50% effort, which is 75%, that'd be like in the low seventies for me. Right. But at the time that I was jumping back onto the mound, I could not possibly throw a ball 94 miles per hour. It just wouldn't happen. So then you're asking yourself, well, if I'm throwing 75%, it's 75% of what? At that point, my max velocity that I could possibly muster under any condition was probably like 80. Because my arm just was like physically weak from surgery and not throwing for quite a long time, right? So then it's kind of like this weird question of like 50% effort of what? 75% effort of what? 90% effort of of what? And that what changes over time, right? Yeah, that's probably one of the hardest things that guys at this phase are are struggling with because maybe dad wants to pull out the radar gun while they're throwing a bullpen to their kid brother and wants to see what is 50%? What, what are you looking like on the mound today? But again, it goes back to what we've been discussing with just because you feel good today doesn't mean you're going to throw the hardest you've ever thrown. You, you really have to perceive Perception, in my opinion, is one of the best things that we have because today your arm may feel good, but your perceived effort is garbage. And maybe tomorrow when you go back to play and catch again, your arm may not feel perfect, but your effort is better than it was yesterday. So you really have to, there's so much fluidity to the throwing progressions in a UCL program that it's very hard to quantify all of this, but I think the easiest thing to do for a young player is go by feel. 
There's no wrong way. You're not going to steer yourself wrong by going with how you feel in your gut. So remind me, at what point typically, at what like month, is a player allowed to throw full speed again? Like their first time in the bullpen, it says 100% on their chart. They can air it out and let it eat. So that varies for every player just because every rehab is different. But I would say usually right before guys start getting back on the mound again, which is somewhere between 10 and a half, 11 months of where you, we really start to have your full repertoire a hundred percent. So usually between months nine and 10 is where you start just fastball curve, uh, excuse me, fastball changeups. And then usually around 10, 10 and a half, again, depending upon where you're at in your, your rehab, maybe there's different things that we slowed you down on. Maybe you decided to hold off on a slider or your curveball, but usually I would say somewhere around 10 and a half months is where you have all of your pitches a hundred percent, because then the last month of your mound progression is going to be seeing hitters and, and getting ready for sim games and then game game play. Yeah. And so let's talk about just how the velocity comes back because everything is kind of slow in months zero through four. It's just rehab, right? Uh, months four through eight, things get a little more exciting, but it's still throw slow because you're, you know, you're lobbing the ball at first and then slowly moving back. But in the mound phase, things start to really accelerate. Like you start at 50%, then you're quickly at 75% effort. And then at 75% effort and above, you start to feel more like a normal pitcher. Like that's, those are like normal, you know, if you're in the middle of a season, you would throw a bullpen at 75% between starts, right? Like you're not throwing hundred percent bullpens in case you didn't know this, <laughs> you don't throw full speed bullpens between starts in college or uh, pro ball. So you start to just feel pretty normal what you're doing. And then from there, the weeks just start to fly off. And suddenly you're like, Oh, 90%, this is getting real. Like I'm almost back to full, like throwing as hard as I can. And this is where a lot of stuff gets really complicated because as you start to get, especially from 75% and up, especially 90% and up, your arm definitely starts to react more. So when you go from 75 to 90% effort, a lot more soreness, sometimes some pain. And this is where you start to get really concerned because you're having legit pain for the first time again, or you're having pretty intense soreness for the first time. And you actually have to push yourself. Like, I need to throw 90% today. Like, I have to throw harder. And then when you get to 100%, and I, I still remember my first 100% bull, effort bullpen in college, which was my first uh, Tommy John surgery, I threw absolutely as hard as I can. And it, it's scary because you don't want to blow your arm out. But, like, I got through it, and I, I really did let it go, and it was, like, 78. <laughs> and and prior to getting hurt, I threw 89 to 92 at that point in college. So that was very demoralizing, which is why I remember that day so vividly, because I was like, I was physically exhausted. Like, I felt like I just like went 10 rounds with Mike Tyson, although no one ever goes more than one round with Mike Tyson or even makes it past, you know, the first bell of Mike Tyson. But I was exhausted and the best I could muster was like literally 78. And I was like, I'm broken. This is terrible. This is the worst day of my life. And then this is where trusting the process comes back in because then, you know, you give it a week, like your arm's kind of sore. Then you like do your next bullpen or, you know, it, it's typically like three or four days between bullpens at this point. But I think I, I was like pretty sore. So I waited. And then the next one, I felt pretty much the same, but it was like 81. I was like, OK, OK. And that's kind of how it is. Like your effort level starts to come down because you start to get used to throwing full speed again, like you get in shape. And I tell people every year, the only way you really get into game shape is from pitching in games. Bullpens do not make you in game shape. Like that's why having a hundred pitch bullpens don't really do that much because it's like, it's like jogging to prepare for a, a sprint race. Like it just doesn't, it doesn't affect your body the same way. And, uh, and so you just, you continue to trust the process and you just continue to ramp up your effort and, and your hundred percent goes from, like, like for me, it went from 78 was 100% at month eight or whatever. And then a, a month later, 100% was like 85. And I'm like, okay, now I'm getting close. Like I'm only five miles per hour away from like sort of like my benchmark, which was, you know, 90 was a good, was a good benchmark for me at that point. And then you're like, okay, it's going to just continue to creep up one mile per hour at a time, whatever. I start to, it starts to get easier to throw 85 than it was at first. And, but those first months are mentally really challenging because you just feel a little bit broken. Throwing is very exhausting. 
and you're just not used to going that fast down the mound. Like you feel like you're out of control throwing 82 and you're like, Oh my God, like this is the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, Frank, do you get those kind of remarks from your players as they come to you in this point in the rehab? There are a lot of those similar concerns. And one of the biggest ones is I get guys texting me like, Hey, I threw my first bullpen at a hundred percent and I'm only throwing 77 miles an hour. I actually had a kid text me that uh, at a big time division one university and, uh, he wound up getting drafted the, the subsequent year. But a lot of guys will say there is no one specific point in time, but it's like a light switch. All of a sudden, they don't know when it happens, where it happens, but they go from throwing 100% bullpens at 67 miles an hour to throwing 100% bullpens and they're touching 92. The one thing I will say is that a lot of young athletes will say, oh, I've been throwing harder than I've ever thrown before. And they and that's actually led other kids to say, hey, I need Tommy John surgery in the absence of injury just for performance enhancement. And that is not the case at all. There is not a surgeon in the world that will touch you in, in the absence of a true UCL injury. But when it comes from the mound and being able to really, when is that time that everything's just going to click? There's no one date. There's no at the 10 month mark, circle that in, in red on the calendar because it's, it doesn't happen like that. Unfortunately, for some guys, it does and they have a smooth trajectory. Other guys, it's a little bit more, as I talked about earlier in, in earlier videos, it's like the stock market. There's good days, there's bad days. And uh, Dan, you alluded to Mike Reinold and how he talks about different things. He actually put up a gra great graphic once where he said rehab, how it's perceived is it's just normal positive trajectory and how it really should go is more like this, but then how it really goes is more like this. And it, there yeah. is no right way for anybody to say, this is how it's going to play out. We have a lot of standardized benchmarks that we know that at this point, you should be here at that point, you should be there and kind of it, their guidelines. And at the bottom of every one of our rehab protocols, throwing protocols, I actually put in italics at the bottom in bold, with asterisks around it saying each individual athlete may progress at different paces because just because it takes athlete A 12 months to be throwing 95 miles an hour in their game again, it may take athlete B 14 months. So there is no perfect science to this other than, again, uh, uh, trust the process. It's very difficult for some athletes to fully grasp it until they're in that very moment. And it's easy for me to say it because I'm the one that uh, helps create the process. So it, for, for me, who's never had Tommy John surgery, it's easy for me to say that. But on the other end of things, I, I do this every day. This is the first time this athlete is doing this and hopefully the last. So uh, again, there's no one specific time that we can say this is when you should anticipate being able to throw hard again. But we know that over the thousands of players that have had Tommy John surgery, this is how their, their outline, how their trajectory has been. Yeah. And I, I think I, my, in my first surgery, my first surgery had a little faster timeline. I think I hit 90 again at the eight and a half month mark. And then in my second one, I think it was like nine and a half months or 10, something like that. But, um, that 90 wasn't my max velocity either, either time. So it took a little longer, but my second surgery was interesting because as I mentioned, I did all my rehab indoors with a radar gun. And when I finally hit the point where I was ready to like, I need to see, I need to throw to live hitters and do simulated games. I think the highest I had been on in my indoor throwing was like 88 miles per hour. That was like exhausting. It was the hardest I could throw. And I've always been a big adrenaline thrower. I don't know how so many kids are running and throwing 92 inside and bullpens today. I don't know how they do it. I always need, I always get like a three to five mile per hour boost from bullpen to game. So my first time out, I found a local adult league team that I latched on with. I, I explained the, the situation and I had my buddy, my business partner, who we own the baseball academy. He came out with the radar gun just to you know, have a reference. I want to know what was going on. I had no idea how hard I was throwing in my first inning. And uh, I asked the catcher after my first inning was done. I was gassed. I was very tired. I was going to throw two innings, though. And, and, and this guy went to some local, like a uh, smaller college. And I was like, how hard do you think I'm throwing? He's like, oh, I, don't, I don't know, 85, 86. 
I was, I touched 94 in that first inning. I was like, you are an idiot. First of all, like you don't know, how do you not know that a difference between 85 and 94, very large difference hitters know the difference between that. Um, but anyway, uh, it was a, it was just a big surprise to be quite honest. Like I had no idea that I would make that big of a leap in one day, just going back into games, um, you know, getting the adrenaline and seeing hitters. And I, I could not possibly have, ex- have told you that I was throwing, 91 to 94, which is what I was sitting that that day. And it was exciting. Now I pitched the second inning and here's how that second inning went. Uh, my velocity dropped to 80, 88 to 91. And I started having pain after the first hitter and I gave this sign and I walked off the mound. <laughs> so that's how that first outing went. Um, and it wasn't the way I wanted it to end, but I was like, this is how it's going to go. And I told my team, like, look, I might make it through both innings. I might not. I don't know. And I didn't. Right. I had some pain and I was like listening to my body and I said, my arms had enough. We had a good, good first inning. And and the thing to remember about all this is that when you get into a game for the first time, it's much less like there's so much more than just, you know, I've been throwing 30 to 50 pitch bullpens. Right. But that's 30 to 50 pitches. I threw 30 pitches in the bullpen, just getting ready to go into the game for the first time. And then I throw six warm-up pitches on the mound, or actually eight, before my first inning. Then I threw 20 pitches because I wasn't sharp, right? I, I, I think I walked a guy, like I was like five or six pitches to every batter. I struck almost all of them out because I was throwing hard. But, um, you know, there was a long inning. So you got your eight warm-up pitches plus 20. Then I go out the next inning, throw another six or eight. I think I asked for eight because I just like need a little more to warm up. So now, as that second inning comes, I've already thrown 70 pitches that day, essentially, right? Like, it's a a big jump from my normal workload. So people need to remember that. Like, when you start to get back into a game, you forget that there's so much throwing that just goes into even one inning of an outing, right? And then you think about, how am I going to get back as a starter and throw seven full innings? That's a lot of throwing, including the bullpen, the warm-ups between innings, and the actual game itself. Your day of throwing, if you threw 100 pitches in a game, is really more like, 150, 160, 170. It's a lot. Yeah, that's a significant volume, especially when you when you think about it that way. The one thing I will say about adrenaline is when guys get in there and they get a hitter with a different colored jersey in the box, all of a sudden they go from throwing 85 to throwing 93. So that is a big thing. Dr. Ahmad tells a story frequently about a former Yankee pitcher who was a power pitcher and they went to do a 3D analysis on him while he was throwing. And this guy threw almost 100 miles an hour as a starter and consistently. And he wasn't even breaking 85. And they realized in the middle of this outing, they're like, something's got to be wrong with this guy. He's hitting, he's only sitting 85. They realized once he got a batter in the box, when his adrenaline went through the roof, that's where his velocity came from. And that's where he became that power pitcher. So the intrinsics and our body's natural system will really help us take over. And it's really cool to see that happen. But again, there's a time and a place for us in a rehab setting to let that happen. And to have somebody do that before the year anniversary for a full reconstruction is a little crazy. There for the repair work, those guys are on the mound much sooner. So uh, again, for them, they're on the mound. They're returning to games in this eight to twelve month window following surgery. They should be back in games somewhere around eight months. Again, seasonal timing, career timing, notwithstanding. But usually within seven or eight months, they're back on the mound. So there, there's so much that we could talk about when it when it comes to like adrenaline and getting other hitters in the box. But when we're talking about just your overall mound progression, it, it's really, uh, we want to make sure that you're not jumping into too much too soon. And again, there is a time and a place for all of these things to be sprinkled into your rehab. Yeah. And let's talk about the strength training aspect, because this, I think, is the most complicated time for your strength training and your rehab, because as you add new off speed pitches, they almost always make your arms sore. So, you know, you start off your your mound progression and you're just throwing fastballs for a little while. Then this fun day comes when you can throw change ups and your arm is very sore from change ups. And you're like, wow, I would have never thought a change up would be that different of a stimulus on my arm. But it is like your arm tells you, hey, this was new. And I didn't like it. Right. And um, and then you start to throw your curveball again or, or your slider or whatever. And they all make your arm feel bad, typically. Um, not always pain, sometimes pain, sometimes soreness, but there's always a reaction. Right. 
And so then this is where it gets complicated because you're typically throwing two bullpens a week. Maybe it's like Monday, Friday or Monday, Thursday or something. And you you hope to stay on schedule. Like your goal is to stay on schedule, but obviously you you throttle up and throttle down depending on how you feel. But say you throw your bullpen on Monday and you threw curveballs for the first time, your arm is super sore on Tuesday and you're supposed to do strength training. Now you're like, what do I do in strength training today? Can I do can I do rows with 65 pound dumbbells like I was? Can I do a Romanian deadlift where I was holding, you know, 185 pounds or whatever I was capable of doing before? Like you start to really be unsure of what the soreness means and how it interacts with these exercises in the weight room. Because holding a dumbbell when your elbow is sore from pitching, it doesn't, it's not like your UCL is impacted from, you know, holding a barbell, right? But your arm is still sore and it needs to rest and you want it to be healed and recovered from the next bullpen session. And so it becomes really, really complicated listening to your arm. What am I capable of? How much soreness can I, can I work through in the, in the, in the weight room? It just gets really, really difficult and, and very murky about how to navigate the way your body feels when it's got so many new feelings, right? It's like a crying baby. It's like you think it's just now good and then it starts screaming again. I know you you know about that, Frank. <laughs> yeah, it, it is where uh, when, when we're talking about the pain and soreness, those are two very different things. We expect some level of soreness after the introduction of a new stimulus. Pain, if you're feeling this at any point in your throwing program, it's so hard to differentiate sometimes, especially for the younger athletes, between what is pain and what is soreness. Usually, I tell athletes, if your soreness lasts beyond two days, so say you throw on Monday and you're sore on Tuesday, okay, no need to panic. Maybe your soreness improves on Wednesday, but something's still lingering. That's still okay. But if you get to Thursday and it's still around and it is unchanged, that's where you have to really start thinking about, do I need to take a break? Do I need to call my doctor's office? Do I need to talk to my athletic trainers, my PTs, whoever? So once we get out of that 48-hour window, that's where, not that you need to be alarmed, but you need to be really like tuned in, like, hey, what's going on here? So uh, being able to differentiate is, again, very difficult, especially for young athletes, even older athletes. They don't necessarily know. And it becomes a, can I go or is it a no-go day? So again, uh, with new stimulus, they always anticipate it going from fastballs to change-ups, change-ups to curveballs, even something like, Dan, like you said, a Romanian deadlift where you were lifting, say, 150 pounds, but now you're only able to pull 100 pounds. 50 pounds in the grand scheme of things seems like a lot of weight, but maybe that's what your body needs. So there's always times where in a rehab progression, I always factor in, and that's part of what these download weeks are all about in, in various throwing programs, is to make sure that we're not overstimulating and not overdoing it with these athletes. So really being able to listen to your body, understand what your body is telling you is extremely important. And one thing is it, if you want to develop a new pitch in this rehab phase, I, I'm I'm not 100% against it, but it has to be done methodically because now you're teaching your body not only it hasn't thrown off a mound in eight months, maybe even longer, depending upon when the last time you got on a mound was. Maybe it was two months before you were able to have surgery for whatever reason. But uh, if you go back to when the COVID pandemic hit, we had kids that were booked for surgery in March that weren't able to have surgery until May or even June, just because of the way that things were here in New York and New Jersey. So and ho now that we're beyond that, hopefully we never have to see that again. But maybe that is a cause. Uh, maybe there's a reason why it's been almost a year, even you're eight months out from surgery, but it's been 12, 14 months before you stepped on a mound. So knowing that you're going to have these kind of nuances, these new little feelings in your elbow. Like we said, I think we said it in earlier videos, it's like getting a new pair of shoes. Once you run a mile in them, maybe the first time you don't run 10 miles in a new pair of shoes, but you run a mile here, you run two miles there. Next thing you know, over the next couple of weeks, they're your new favorite pair of running shoes. So it's like that with your elbow as well. Yeah. And, and this is where it, it also just takes having a second head on this issue of like, okay, so I threw on Monday, my arm was super sore. It's Thursday and it's still sore enough where I definitely need to push some of my stuff back this week. So then it's like, what does that look like? What do I do? Like I was going to throw a bullpen on Friday, but it's Thursday. I'm still pretty sore. So we're not going to do that. So now what do I do on Friday? Right. Do I play catch? Do I kind of long toss and stretch it out? Like, what does that look like? And then so now if I throw this bullpen on Saturday or Sunday, 
Then what does my next week look like? This is where it just takes sitting down with someone else who is thoughtful about this. And honestly, any person could could do this. You don't have to have a baseball background to say, well, okay, well, this was the way the pro- program was structured, right? We'd have a bullpen Monday. We'd be off on Tuesday, play catch uh, Wednesday, you know, stretch it out on Thursday, bullpen Friday. Those are like the pieces in this puzzle. Those are the stepping stones. So now if we're pushing this back, which of those stepping stones do we fill in to still get our work in and still, you know, continue to get conditioning for our arm and throw? And then what, how do we backfill the rest of the week? And then what does the following week look like? It just becomes this, this thing you're just constantly chopping up and stitching back together at that point. And that's what gets really challenging for people where, um, if a, if a, kids just doing that by himself, uh, it's a little complicated, but having someone who can sit down with you and say, okay, well, we're pushing back two days. So what should we do for these next two days? Let's do this. This is kind of gentle. Then we'll ramp it up if you feel good the next day, and then we'll see how it goes. And sometimes you have to push things back two weeks because your arm's still just cranky. And you're like, you know, this just feels like the right thing to do. And the problem is a lot of players don't want to lose time. They don't want to say, Oh, well, I, I want to be back. I wanted to be back at 12 months. And now if I push back two more weeks, it's not, it's just not going to happen. It's like 12 months was an arbitrary goal, goal line anyway, right? You got to, you got to do what you got to do. You don't know where the finish line is. That, that's a really uh, difficult thing for some athletes is, Hey, this is where I'm supposed to be in my throwing program, but it doesn't work out perfectly all the time. And uh, that's just part of a rehab progression for, for some people, not everybody. Of course, we hope that it goes as smooth as possible, but if you have to take a couple days off, then you have to take a couple days off and you can pick up not necessarily exactly where you were, but close enough that one week isn't a significant amount of time for you in terms of time loss. And just because if that happens early enough in your throwing program, sometimes we're able to speed you up on the back end so that that time loss in the beginning isn't necessarily that significant on the back end of things. So there's so many different ways that we can maneuver and manipulate throwing programs and rehab protocols that is appropriate for an athlete. It's not reckless. We we talked about this in, in previous videos where if it's a bright sunny day and the speed limit's 55, maybe you're doing 60 and it's not reckless. But if you're if it's a snowy day here in the Northeast and there's a foot of snow on the ground, 60 is absolutely crazy, <laughs> you know, where you should be throw you should be driving at 20 miles an hour. So there's so many different permutations within a rehab and within throwing progressions that I players shouldn't be panicked about missing or having to take a week off. And in some cases, we may even prescribe it. We call it a therapeutic break from throwing or even from rehab. So it, it is something that players shouldn't be alarmed about. Yeah, and the last thing I think I really want to mention in this video is that command is very circumspect, circumspect as you come back. And this is something that I think is alarming at times where players are like, I just threw a bullpen and I threw like seven strikes <laughs> out of like 35 pitches. Um, very normal, especially with the off-speed stuff. And this was this was what was a challenge even into my second year back. So both of my surgeries, um, I entered pro ball in my second year back in the second calendar year, which is about 18 months because of my timeline. And my control was just not as good both of those first years back from surgery. And that's a long way past surgery. I mean, again, we're talking about the first season, which was 18 months um, past uh, the, my surgery date. So the dexterity that it takes to really throw a slider in the location that you want it and the dexterity that it takes to throw a change up in the location that you want it, it's a lot more special than people realize. And it doesn't come back that quick. And especially in months eight through 12, when you're thrown off, you know, you're thrown off the mound for the first time in quite a long time. And you have so many other things you're thinking about. You're trying to keep your intensity up. Like you're worried about your mechanics. You're trying to keep your mechanics together. And now you're trying to throw a curveball for a strike. It's just a lot. It's a hard thing to do. And so it's, it, it should be expected that your, com- your command of all, all three pitches or whatever you throw will be trash for a while. And the quality of the break of your off-speed pitches will also be junk for a while. Your curveball will just be flat and not very, not very sharp. Your slider will probably be loopy and just kind of like a cement mixer. They'll get better over time, just like Frank mentioned earlier, just sort of like magically. One day you'll be like, oh, that curveball was nasty. When did that happen? It's been uh, terrible for like four months. But today, for no good reason at all, 
it was nasty. And I fanned three hitters in my, you know, one of my uh, summer league games. It just, it just comes back when it wants to come back. And there's not a clear, clear reason. I think part of the reason is because even when you're, you think you're relaxed in your rehab, you're not really that relaxed. And I think when you're not really that relaxed, you're kind of like forcing it and guiding it. And just like the things you naturally do, the way your body moves, like pitching is such a, a whippy, loose, but powerful motion. And I think you lose a little bit of that just being constantly somewhat tense coming back because again, you're thinking of so much stuff and you're worried and you're hoping it goes well. And I think that just low level tension makes it difficult to throw that breaking ball the way you, you usually would when you're just out there competing and not worrying about any of that rehab stuff and, and your, and your comeback. So the off speed stuff and the command in general is something that we'll talk more in the next video of the 12 month plus phase. Uh, but it's a challenge. So just be ready for pitching to be exhausting, <laughs> your command to be very poor. And there'd be a lot of frustrating things and a lot of feels and emotions and soreness and some pain. Eight through 12 is, is like just haywire, Frank. Just have fun with it. You know, you're on the mound again for the first time in however many months. Have fun. Don't try to be outside yourself. Don't try to be the pitcher that you left behind. I'm not saying reinvent yourself, but really just be a kid again and have fun throwing off the mound and being a pitcher. And uh, I remember being in the dugout and coaches yelling at our, our pitching pitchers on the mound saying, stay within yourself. Don't try to overdo it. Stay within yourself, trust the process, and I promise you, you'll get through it. All right. So hopefully this was helpful. Obviously, months eight through 12 are very complicated, as you can probably tell from us rapping about it. And if you have any more questions about Tommy John recovery, rehab, the surgery itself, Leave us a comment below. I'll respond to all of them. If there's anything that needs Frank's uh, attention, I'll be sure to shoot it his way. Definitely follow Frank uh, on Instagram, Twitter. That's all in the description below as well. And you can follow up with Dr. Ahmad's uh, team over in New York if you're interested in their services at their office. All right. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.